afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. I'm, I'm Diana Erlov, and um, I'm with Peers for Progress, and I want to welcome you to the third quarterly webinar for the National Peer Support Collaborative Learning Network. I'm just going to show my screen. Again, I want to welcome you to the third quarterly webinar for the National Peer Support Collaborative Learning Network. The network is funded through Bristol-Myers Squibb Foundation's Together on Diabetes Initiative and is co-led by Peers for Progress and the National Council of La Raza. The network is focused on developing and sharing evidence of benefits of peer support programs, best practices, effective evaluation methods, models of organizing peer support within health systems, as well as effective models of advocacy. Today's webinar is titled Lessons in State and Local Advocacy for Program Development, featuring Carmen Velasquez, Executive Director of Alivio Medical Center. Before I get started, I want to mention if you experience any type of technical difficulty, you can contact Pat Tang by email at yptang at email.unc.edu, or you can call 504-994-5167. I want to quickly run through the agenda for the webinar. At the beginning of the talk, we're going to show a 10-minute video on Alivio Medical Center. Then you'll hear directly from Carmen. And during the webinar, you may type in questions in the question box that's located in the dock at the right of your screen. And you can submit questions at any time. You do not need to wait for the Q&A session to begin. And if we don't get to your question during the talk, we will certainly follow up with you after the webinar. Um, so now I'd like to hand things over to Ed Fisher, the Global Director of Peers for Progress, who will say a few words and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Diana. It's, it's really a real personal pleasure to introduce Carmen Velasquez. I've known Carmen now for almost two years since we've been working with her and her medical center in, uh, at Alivio, and I've come to have tremendous respect not only for her as an individual, but for the wonderful work of, of Alivio Medical Center that she's fostered over its 24 years. Um, Ms. Velasquez founded Alivio Medical Center in 1989 uh, on an empty lot next to a muffler shop in Chicago. Uh, under her guidance, Alivio has grown to have three sites uh, in Chicago and also three uh, school-based sites uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, and they together, these six sites serve nearly 20,000 patients uh, annually. Uh, uh, recognizing her real stature in the community, uh, Carmen has been appointed to the Cook County Health and Hospital Systems Board of Directors. Uh, she's won numerous awards. I'll mention just a few. Uh, the uh, Helen Rodriguez Trias Health Award from the National Council of La Raza, the Luminary Award from the Senior Citizen Hall of Fame, uh, the 2010 Woman Health Executive Network Woman of the Year Achievement Award. Uh, she's won a recognition award for uh, Alivio's Diabetes Self-Management from the American Diabetes Association. Uh, and in 2009, she received the prestigious Otli, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, award from the Mexican government awarded to distinguished members of the Mexican community in the United States. And she's also received a, uh, an award from the American College of Physicians, uh, again, recognizing the original approach that they've taken to the delivery of health care in, um, in Adelidio. Uh, what prompted us to uh, ask Carmen to do this webinar are a number of conversations we've had over the last few months regarding ways in which the devil uh, in the details associated with the Affordable Care Act uh, will be decided largely at the state level. Um, Medicaid programs, many of the other programs of the Affordable Care Act how they get implemented, how they can support peer support programs will be decided by state regulations and state funding decisions. And Carmen has been re immensely energetic and talented and successful in working with local and state leaders in Chicago and in Illinois. And so we thought she could 
uh, really make a contribution to our network by sharing her wisdom in these areas. So I want to get out of the way and, and let you hear from Carmen. Just quickly before I do that, Manuela uh, McDonough from National Council of La Raza, I thought you might want to say a word or two as well. I know Manuela's logged in, but I'm I not. See her, her phone yeah, screen. her phone is not up, so I don't know if she's okay. having. Well, let, I think Manuela can add some comments uh, later on, and uh, uh, but let's turn it over now to Carmen and Diana. You said you wanted to start with the video. So I will. I will. I will get the video set up. Um, Carmen, did you want to say anything um, before I launch the video, or should I go ahead and launch? All right. No. Go ahead and start, please. Okay. Here we go. And uh, I'll re uh, reinforce uh, and invite uh, the 12 states. I'm very, very impressed we have 12 states uh, joining us uh, for this conversation. Um, let, let, let me be clear of who I'm not. Uh, to uh, our listeners. Uh, first of all, I'm not a nurse. I'm not a doctor. I'm just an ordinary person who, in, a, in about a 1987, 1986, the Cook County Health System in Chicago and the City of Chicago Department of Health um, had an, an incredible summit to begin to di discuss the issues of health care uh, in our communities. And as usual, they talked about access to health care, they also uh, had talked about the cost um, and, of course, are undocumented. Um, as I listened to many, many uh, presentations, uh, read reports, uh, listened to uh, key witnesses of the people who were impacted uh, we, because they did not have health care, I came back to Pilsen, the community in which we uh, have our uh, Livio Medical Center, and I began to look around the neighborhood and look at hey, how is it that we access health care. The more I looked, the more I got, and I, I don't want to use this word, but um, I have to be polite over this webinar I'm told. So um, I was royally uh, unhappy, uh, angry that uh, our community did not have a community health center. Now you can say, hey, come on, come on, Carmen, there had to be something. Yes, there was a city clinic, but at that time, the city clinic um, did not have fluent bilingual or, and or bilingual bicultural um, uh, staff. And also, um, there uh, was not an ability to really uh, say they were, they were saying to everybody they were a free clinic, and you and I know there's nothing free around in this world. But getting back uh, to what I did when I began to explore what is available for our community, I then sat down with a couple of friends of mine who were from the various community organizations, organizers, educators, a nurse, a physician, um, a uh, CEO of Mercy Hospital and Medical Center, the major hospital in our community, and said, we need to do something. And so we started to brainstorm, and as we brainstormed, we then said, uh, this is what we want. We need to define what is it we want. When uh, we did that, um, I, I um, began to realize that uh, what we needed to do is be very, very aggressive. And let me say to you, I'm going to deviate here and table what I'm saying and say to you, well, what makes a person uh, have that fire in that belly that says, this is not right, this is unjust, and we need to do something. And I have to tell you, I come from a family that also is very ordinary, but the lesson that I have been given is uh, that we must make a difference in what we do and, 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 and how we live. And so my, my family's uh, example, my parents really, really gave us that example of, you need to make a difference. And so let me go back to uh, where we were when we were looking at what is it that we don't have and how can we make it happen. At the same time we were brainstorming on what we wanted, we were trying to identify the it. And you know, all of us know what the it is in our communities because 
what happens is we have to put it on paper, and sometimes that's a pain in the butt. But documentation, documentation. While we were trying to um, brainstorm, uh, an initiative came out from a major foundation called the Chicago Community Trust. It was a $10 million initiative. And so right away when I found that out, uh, I said, let's submit a proposal. And we submitted a proposal. We submitted a proposal for uh, $896,236. This is what we said we wanted to do with the money. We wanted a comprehensive community health center that included primary care. We wanted a comprehensive community health center that had supportive services, had health education, that had behavioral health, that had uh, the uh, social workers, the case management people that uh, would give a service to our community. Now, what happened with that? Oh, and also we wanted uh, to do a needs assessment. Again, documenting what, uh, what we know already, but we had to put it on paper. And also we had to find a location where we might uh, have the Alivio, uh, and, and in those days, we didn't call it Alivio Medical Center, we called it Proyecto Alivio, Project Alivio. So here we are. Uh, there's around five of us. And we said, OK, now what? Now, so we submit the proposal. And you know what? We got funded. We got funded for the $896,236. And that we all looked at each other and said, we don't have a place. Panic. So one of the members of the committee, who uh, is a director of another organization in, in, uh, in uh, Pilsen called El Valor. He's kind of a tall, lanky man. And if you look at my picture in that little video, uh, you kind of know I'm kind of short and kind of, uh, uh, I'll use the word stocky. So here comes Don Quixote and Sancho Pancha to knocking on doors, asking uh, in the neighborhood on one major street, uh, are you selling this uh, building? Are you selling this or that? And they would look at us and say, these people are crazy. They don't have any money. So as we're walking, we see an empty lot with some uh, uh, trucks on it. And I tell my buddy, hey, uh, Vincent, do you see what I see? And sometimes what happens with us when we're, we're doing anything in life, we pass things, by, pass things by because we don't see them because they're so close to us. Going forward then, we go to the muffler shop, knock on the door, and ask the guy if she's selling this. Now remember, neither Vincent or I have un centavo, not a penny to our name. But we're asking this man, are you, who owns this lot? Because we want to buy it. Now that's pretty nervy, but you know, this is what you have to do. You have to have the guts, and we have to be risk takers. This is part of the process. So the man says, offer me something. I went back to our committee and said, uh, we have a land. And, and they looked at us and said, and, and I'm really, really going to say this. I'm not going to, I'll cut this short, the story of how we were born. Um, to make a long story short, we bought the land. We built a 10,000 square foot facility. And uh, we um, opened our doors uh, on uh, January 4th, 1989. Now, we now are looking at what kind of model of care are we doing? So what we said to ourselves is we want primary care, we want midwives. That was another thing. We wanted parteras. Parteras because where we come from, you know, we don't, don't always need to have a doc. Now that's hip hypocrisy, no. But if for the woman who is well, for the woman who is healthy, she can deliver her baby. And the midwife can catch the baby, as they say in the jargon of midwifery. So here we are. Uh, we're wanting midwifery. We're wanting uh, dental care. We're wanting uh, manage, um, the care management. Uh, we also want senior services, uh, WIC. We want it all. And this is where it's very important for those of us who really say, hey, we want, the, we want, we want this because it's the right thing to do. So the role of, 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 uh, of Alivio and its, its uh, core group and uh, uh, the idea of grassroots is very, very important. And as I say grassroots, 
This is where community health workers come in. We call them here at Alivio Compañeros en Salud. The role of community health workers are ordinary people who are the neighborhood people who can make a difference to another uh, person uh, from the neighborhood. It could be their cousin, la, com la comadre, the uh, tia, the sister, but they make a difference in, in encouraging them uh, how to deal with life. But that, I'm moving too fast because here's what happened with our, um, with our issue. We service, and we here in the Pilsen community, it's a pro predominantly Mexican community, and really, it's not in one community we serve, and we service nine community areas. And as we do that, we are looking at uh, an incredible uh, community that, uh, in the majority, are undocumented. Today, in the figure that how many patients do we really service, we service 28,000 patients. Now, that's a lot of people, and the majority are, und are undocumented. So. That is a, a challenge in themselves because, as you know, when we look at the model of care that we wanted to provide, we said, okay, how are we going to do it and who's going to allow us to do it? And, oh, by the way, Alivio Medical Center is a federally qualified health center, but we weren't always a federally qualified health center. In fact, when we submitted our, our uh, application to the Bureau of Primary Health Care, they uh, didn't give us uh, the money we requested. They gave us about 90,000 90, lousy dollars, to be honest with you. I, that made me outraged. So <laughs> I then went on a, on a tirade to really, and I really uh, organized a, um, a six-month uh, crusade, if you want to call it, or a camp campaign, to not, not to be melodramatic, that really um, I asked for letters of support from the National Council of La Raza. I went to all the uh, politicos and congressional leadership in the state of Illinois. Uh, we had the uh, National Health Alliance uh, that's in Washington, D.C. Um, we implored everybody and their brother to really make the feds uh, give us more money as a, and to recognize this as a federally qualified health center. What happened is, all of a sudden, uh, and meanwhile, Alivia keeps growing, and we're, we're needing more and more space. What happens is the federal government sent a, um, a consultant to really see what the heck is going on in Chicago, Illinois, at Alivio Medical Center. Well, the consultant comes and looks at me and says, you know, I was really sent here to slow you down, but you know what? My recommendation to the Bureau is that you need another center. Well, I wasn't quite prepared for another center. However, uh, I accepted the challenge and uh, started to look for some land. And we saw three acres of land um, and said, OK, we want to buy this. And again, where are we going to get the money? So we, what we did is organize a capital campaign uh, so that we could raise $7 million. We raised $7 million, and for those of you who remember, there was the, um, uh, an initiative uh, in 2000, uh, 1999, 1995 rather, that uh, allowed you to, uh, it gave $10 million to, uh, to about seven uh, states in the, in the country. Um, we had asked for money from them. Um, and, and, and I say 1995 because I, re, I really remember on December the 14th, we submitted our proposal, and it really took us five years. So it doesn't happen overnight. We opened our doors, I don't you remember, on January 3rd, 2000. The work we had to do to organize our issues, submit a proposal, um, have people listen to us for major funding, get a capital campaign organized. It took us five years to get the Alivio on Morgan, and this is a 28,000 square foot facility. I am telling you, I had no intentions of coming to Alivio at the, at the Morgan site because my heart was at the western site. That was the La Madre de Patria, as we would say. That was the, the original site, and it was going to take a lot for me to leave it. Well, when I came here, I had to set the tone, 
And so I came here and I had I, I put an office here. But that but the point is, um, where in the world do ordinary people get the guts, the stamina to do and go forward and say we can do this? The ordinary person believes and knows that there are issues there that only we and I don't mean only that means exclusion. I mean only in that we have to take responsibility. We need to be able to say it's not only the the process of give me and I, I, I you know and, and that's okay. That the issue that and that my family and I was like, well, what are you going to do to make it happen? So this is what we did, and we opened um, the Alivio Morgan site on January third. Uh, 2000, 28,000 square foot facility. Now, again, uh, the Fed did not give us, by the way, money for operations, and that was a killer. We struggled in the initial years to uh, begin. Uh, when you know, when you open a, a, a restaurant, you know, everybody's saying it takes three years. When you open any business, you have a period of time where it's a startup. But I'm going to tell you. Um, I was sweating that la, la gorda, gorda uh, in saying, whoa, how are we going to get the, um, the patient base to really make this place uh, pay for itself? We now have a $15 million budget. Uh, we are going to open another clinic, 13,000 square foot, in the town of Berwyn, Cicero. We are opening up another clinic at, in a local high school here uh, called Benito Juarez High School. And we are ready to roll. Is it easy? No. We continue to struggle. We struggle immensely. But I think we also know we, when you have an opportunity, for example, you, you take it. For example, when um, uh, Ed Fisher, and really we met Ed Fisher in the Peers for Progress through uh, the National Council of La um, People say, well, well, how did you do this? How do you... How do, you, how do you make this happen? It's relationships. And you can't sit down in your office and, and, and just say, well, we built it and they're going to come, or, well, you know, um, they're going to help us because they know we need it. You know, we have to organize ourselves, our community, that says we bring something to this country. We are the USA with all of you. And I say that because the issue of the undocumented is a hot and heavy issue all over the country. Right now, we are in a country where, in spite of the fact this is the greatest country in the world, I believe, but I also know this is a country that continues to be racist. It continues to really look at the undocumented or this person who is different in a way that says, mm, it's exclusion, not inclusion. So we need to challenge that. And this is the role I have been given to, uh, to, um, to, to do in, 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 in this, uh, in this uh, uh, mission of Alivio. And I say it's a mission because I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't work this hard for anybody, not for a hospital, not for anything. Uh, this is a, a, a labor of, of I guess uh, love. Uh, this is a um, a labor of knowing you're doing the right thing, um, and when you see the families come in, the children come in, the grandparents come in, you know you're doing the right thing. We're embarking on the uh, Affordable Care Act that now has, I think, what two, three years in the making. But you know what? The undocumented are still excluded. The county care system in the state of Illinois um, has uh, asked the feds, hey, let us enroll uh, potential uh, new Medicaid uh, uh, patients uh, a year ahead of time. So we're in the process of doing that. But you know what? We're still excluded. County care does not include the undocumented. And again, that angers me. And so we need to find a way. Um, I, um, I'm going to deviate in a little bit that says that I believe there is a way. And I hope you all find out a little more about 
this thing called the Cooperative in the Accountable Care Act. The Cooperative uh, was um, uh, formed in that it's a not-for-profit profit managed care uh, uh, program. And I'm saying I'm looking for a loophole where we can get the undocumented into the system of the Accountable Care Act. Now, uh, we know there's immigration reform. Immigration reform, I'm going to tell you, right now, we're in a country that's making a decision. The decision, again, is unjust. Uh, unjust, and I'm uh, being told to we have a question and answer break. But that's OK. Let me finish the issue on, on immigration. We had an election. And the election said, the first time around, we had a hope that the president, Barack Obama, was going to really embrace in the same manner that he took a lot of heat for the Accountable Care Act, that we would have immigration reform. Four years later, nothing. Four years later, you have families ha that have been separated. You have families that have been destroyed because of the, uh, of the immigration uh, sentiment in this country. Now, what is it that you have? You have a, uh, a political party, party that is now getting religion and saying, ah, oh, we better pay attention to this. But now they want to create a war with 20,000 people at the wall so that they can say, we provided jobs. They're not worried about the security or the justice of access to care or the justice to say, let's do the right thing. So I have very strong feelings that we as a people, the ordinary people, you who work in the communities, you who are the, um, the, um, the, uh, the teachers uh, of, 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 our, of our kids, we need to inspire those who really want to do the right thing to stand up. It's not easy to stand up and say, I serve the undocumented. You know, I have a brother who has a, a, a tortilla factory. They raid his company all the time. Why is it that they do, they do not raid Alivio Medical Center? They don't raid Alivio Medical Center because, as um, they were, since you and I know, our government sometimes speaks with a forked tongue. Now, we also know that um, we need to change the thought and sentiments of our politicos. Springfield, the state, the feds, all of the country, over the country, we all are saying we need immigration reform so that the ordinary person can reunite, reunite with his family, but more than all, everything. We bring so much to this country. A family. We bring our labor of work and by our hands. We're willing to work. We want to make a difference in this country. Advocates we have to be. There is no way that we can have uh, a system that continues to uh, move us out of the system. Let me, let me say one more thing before I take a break for questions. You know, everybody knows that there was courageous behavior by Rosa Parks when she got up from the back of the bus and said, I want to sit in the front of the bus. Well, we have to be courageous and also say, you know what? Please look at us as human beings. Don't look at us as um, the, and the aliens, the people who are, uh, you know, are here illegally. I'm going to tell you, it's not going to happen. There's too many of us. We, we will continue to fight for what is right for, for people. And healthcare is only a part of the real mission. The real mission for all of us is to make a difference in every aspect of the life of a human being. And I'm saying to you, this is not easy work. Um, and we are here to tell you, if you want to make a difference, you've got to be at the table. You've got to be going to those meetings. You've got to be going to Springfield, to the legislators, and to Washington, D.C., and say, you've got to change the way you're doing business. Now, I know there are a lot of questions out there, I hope. Um, and any question that might be on the table, I'd be more than happy to, um, to uh, address any questions. And any questions? 
Yes, we do have one question, Carmen. This is Diana. We have one question. Here it is. In addition to your commitment, what secrets have you learned about how to gain resources for programs like yours? Um, for example, when we were doing that capital campaign uh, for the West, for the West, uh, for the Morgan site, uh, we um, organized a, a capital campaign within our employees because I said to our employees, I need to have the ability to say to funders that we, I, Carmen Velasquez, you, Juan Ballesteros, took money out of, out of your pocket to uh, help raise and uh, pay for the, uh, the building we want to build. We had a campaign, and our staff raised over $32,000. Uh, the, the center cost $7 million, but, 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 the, but what we wanted to show was we wanted to tell them, we can do this. We, we're not only asking, we're also taking out of our pocket to help make this happen. Um, also, the, the absolute... Uh, how to say, consistency of, of, of really respecting the people you serve, but also challenging those people who have the power to make decisions that will help you build a, a, uh, an entity like a, a, an alivio or a school. This is about putting yourself on the line that says, all right, if they tell me once, no, or twice, or three times, or four times, I will not take no for an answer. And I'm going to tell you a more recent story. Um, for the new center that um, we're going to open in Berwyn, Cicero, um, I asked for an amount of money that was substantial for operations. And that was the uh, last, uh, about nine, 10 months ago, and there's a lot of politics in this. Um, they told me no. So about a, a three or four weeks ago, I resubmitted a letter to the same foundation and said, I want you to reconsider it. And as I'm speaking to you now, I got a call yesterday from uh, that foundation that they're going to refer my request to the um, uh, grants committee. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I, because I cannot share more specifics, but I'm going to tell you, there was so much politics in this that um, we really believe, and they're going to, that Grants Committee is going to meet in November, uh, I really believe that uh, they will give it serious consideration. So you always have to keep trying, even when they say no. Thanks, Carmen. Um, here's another question. Um, please talk about cooperative and how you might work with them. Well, and the of, okay. Okay. We're, 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 when the uh, How to Will Care Act uh, came to be, I said, well, there has to be some loophole where the undocumented can have access to health care. So if the cooperatives Oh, uh, here in Illinois, there's a cooperative that was uh, that was recognized and given money to do a, a cooperative, and so they're forming a not a, so a cooperative is a not-for-profit. So they're forming a not-for-profit managed care program, and they're calling it the Land of Lincoln. So I am saying that why can't the undocumented um, say to the Land of Lincoln? Uh, provider, I want to buy some insurance from you, you know. And then people are saying, no, 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 no. If if, uh, if governmental, if, if the feds gain money, they can't do that. But wait a minute, this is a not for profit. The not for profit should be able to say, why can't I give it? I'm going to tell you. Here's another. Right now, I'm in the midst of trying to to start a campaign about the cooperative. Because it's, uh, when I met with the director of this uh, cooperative here in Chicago, um, one of the things we, we kind of sniffed out is we need to go to Congressman Luis Gutierrez, we need to go to uh, Senator Durbin and say, we want to access health care for the undocumented through the uh, cooperative 
that was established uh, through the Affordable uh, Care Act. That that and I we're not finished exploring it, but this is where where I'm saying this is what we have to do. You have to begin this. Uh, you know, go to the stores uh, where you think you might get uh, some. Someone will listen to, but you get slowly but surely other people to listen. Um, we have several groups are now listening here in Chicago who really want to take leadership in this. I don't care who leads it, to be frank with you. I want to be able to say the cooperative is a vehicle by which the undocumented can buy health care uh, insurance. Uh, that's the important thing to do. And the mere fact that 14 states are going to now ask, what is this thing called the cooperative? There's only seven were funded. Uh, I know New York had, was funded. I think Colorado was funded. I'm, I'm not sure about the other states. But please, pursue it, because if, if it's one person, uh, it's, it's that crazy lady again. But if there's several people doing it, and, and then hundreds and then thousands, it will make a difference. Thanks, Carmen. There's another question. How have you been able to navigate the politics? Well, I guess I have to tell a secret. Uh, my background is education, and that's not the secret. But my, I'm 73 years old, OK? And um, I really was, in, I was a member of the Chicago School Board. Um, I worked for the State Board of Education in bilingual education, and uh, was a social worker. Um, I've done a lot of things in my life, but I managed to have the relationships in our in our communities, especially with the the, the um, not-for-profit uh, organizations and and uh, and the schools. And so, what you do is you build relationships. What you need to do when you want to keep moving things forward is you have to build relationships. And that takes time. You can't go home at 4 or 5. You got to go to the fundraiser. On Saturday, you got to go to the meeting or to the health fair. And on Sunday, oh, can you come here to do this? Uh, go to a conference. This is, this is how it is. It's very, it, it, it's organizing in the, in the pure sense. It's the, you, it's, the, or, the organizing mentality of you live, you eat, and you breathe this. Thanks, Carmen. There's another question. Um, how was the process, what was the process like to apply and become an FQHC? I'm sorry? Well, how was the process? Yes. Can you repeat? Yes, can you describe the process that you went through to become, um, apply and become an, a federally qualified health center? Um, well, there's a there's a major application and certain uh, request. Um, you know, you need to do a needs assessment. Uh, you and you need to. Uh, oh, and the, and at the time that uh, we were uh, applying for the status of a federally qualified health center, the criteria that was being used was low infant mortality rate, and they would give certain points. And I think for that. One, um, uh, how do you call that? One um, requirement. They gave 35 points. Now you know, in the Mexican community, we do not have a high infant mortality rate, and and if you're in California and there's a large uh, Asian population there, they do not have a large uh, high infant mortality rate. And so, uh, the first time around, I told you when that the uh, they told us no, and that's when they, and that's when I started to arm this campaign of saying, you know, don't blame me because we, we, you know, when we come here to this country, we're healthy. When we stay here a couple of years, and then we'll we'll have a high percentage of low infant um, mortality rate. But but it's 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 a long application, um, and uh, you really have to have. Uh, uh, the the tenacity to really fill out that application uh, it take, uh, it, it ask you a lot of questions of who you're going to serve how you're going to serve um, you really need to know uh, you have to oh uh, from, and to be a federally qualified health center by the way you must have 51 percent of your board must be patients of your 
Community Health Center. And that's another one. Um, I, I, and we're covered by what's called the Federal Tort Claims Act, which, uh, in other words, it covers the liability of uh, those who work here, the providers especially. Um, there is a higher reimbursement rate that is given to you, but you really have to have a business plan, a health care plan, um, uh, how are you going to sustain uh, this once uh, the, uh, uh, the funding, because the funding that defense gives you doesn't pay for the entire cost of what you want to do always. Thanks, Carmen. Here's another question. I know I need to work with our state government, but can't figure out where to begin. Should I contact my state legislators or the head of health services in our state? How do I reach these people? What I, I, what I would do is call your local state uh, legislator uh, or, and state representative, invite them to your center. Or if not, if you don't have a center and you want to have a center, invite them to whoever your core group of people you're working with, with and begin to uh, tell them, you know, uh, and have some, some, um, some information for them. If you want to build a community health center, you and say, well, you know, um, here in this part of town, there isn't a community health center. Or, you know, I'm, I, I was very upset that in Tilson there were no um, uh, senior services. Well, with time, uh, uh, and I said we, uh, we had some land to sell, and another not-for-profit came to us and said, would you sell us your land? And here's what I told them. On three conditions. One, trust. Because I don't do anything without trusting you. Two, uh, I want you to really consider to do something for um, uh, seniors. And then three, uh, we went to the city of Chicago that in the building that they were going to build for, for the seniors, we wanted the first floor to be a senior satellite center. We did it. They built two buildings. One is apartment for low-income families, and another is uh, um, apartments for low-income seniors. And on the first floor, we have um, uh, Casa Maravilla, which is the senior service center run by Alivio Medical Center. All this wasn't done overnight. I'm telling you, it was not done overnight. Even as I sit here and talk to you now, um, as we go into Berwyn, the Cicero, our new site, we're talking to the hospital, our provider of, of choice, and saying to them, well, you know, we really are interested in um, doing a freestanding uh, midwifery uh, center. And by that I mean in my uh, vision of a freestanding uh, midwifery center is really a, uh, a bundle. Uh, in Chicago, they have this house that we call a bungalow. I don't know how to describe it. But anyway, it, it's a home. It's an ordinary little, little brick home. And so what we want to, and, and in fact, I got the hospital to give me a bungalow. But I have to put that and table it because that is going to take some operations money. It's also going to have to have involvement of the community. Uh, what the, the house, that, that's a beautiful little house on the corner uh, that is waiting to be a birthing center. We have to go to the neighborhoods, to the neighbors and say, this is what we would like to do. And this is why we think this would be good for uh, for the neighborhood, and, and uh, is there any concerns you might have uh, regarding having a birthday center on your block? This does not happen overnight. Thanks, Carmen. Here's another question. Um, how did you start the Compañeros en Salud program? Um, what was the impetus for starting it, and where do you see it headed in the future? Well, this is an exciting question. I basically am a, a, a community person. Uh, I don't pretend to be anything else, and I absolutely know the value of an ordinary person uh, that can do many, many things. Um, so what we believe is that the gra how, so it, let's answer the question, Carmen. How did the Compañeros in Salud start? We were wanting to have uh, community health workers here at Alivio, but we didn't have money. And we 
had um, um, some some uh, community health workers in, in another neighborhood called Little Village, and so I met with them and I said, well, would uh, you, if we identified some people who are interested in your uh, curriculum, would you, um, would you help us? And so we were about to do that when a young woman came to me and said, uh, I would like to um, organize uh, community health workers and do something here at Alivio. I didn't have money to pay her. So I think I hired her like for four hours a week. Four hours a week now. And and I also saw the the ability of having community health workers as a workforce development career ladder for for ordinary people. So what happened is little by little the program grew. We had about nine, uh, we hired, and what happened is, one street, I'm, I'm giving the story fast, but we uh, trained, I know, over 100 um, community health workers, and um, we hired about seven of those full-time. And this was, we were doing this for about three or four years. When uh, uh, we got a knock on our door, from the National Council of La Raza saying, there's this program called Peers for Progress, and they want to do X, Y, Z with community health workers. And so that's how we got into the Peers for Progress. But how it really started was the recognition of the value of grassroots people making a difference in people's lives, in, 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 for example, in diabetes and self-management. And where do you see this head? Where do you see the Compañeros en Salud program headed in the future, Carmen? Well, we need to figure out how to sustain it. But there's also a movement of community health pro community health workers across the country. The, the issue is some people want to have um, certificates of for community health workers. And by that I mean, you know, to go to a junior college or have a university recognize and formalize a curriculum. I have very, very mixed feelings about that. I firmly believe that um, the training and the curriculum that Alivio has developed does not necessarily necessitate to be certified uh, nurse, uh, a certified uh, community health worker. And there's some serious discussions because even right now, I uh, had a meeting with Juan and a couple of other people who wanted us to, to take them to our state senator to say would he support um, the, uh, the, the, the certification of community health workers. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to support that I, because I think it will exclude uh, our community. But I tell you what, what we do need is more funding from uh, the com for the community health workers. What is happening is, is that in spite of the fact that the Accountable Care Act says, or the Affordable Care Act says, hey, health education is the way to, you know, really have, instead of dealing with sickness, we deal with prevention. We deal with people self-managing what they need to uh, address uh, in, in, their, in their health lifestyles. So, um, but this is a struggle. This is a real struggle for everybody. You know, how do you fund it? Everybody wants you to do everything, but at the same time, you know, you need the support and the people need. This is a this is a, a possibility of. We also envisioned with the people we trained that the parks would hire hire them, the uh, schools would hire them, and that that has happened in some instances here in Chicago. Thanks, Carmen. Um, we don't have any current other questions right now. Um, if, were there other things that you wanted to, to address in the webinar? Yeah. Yeah, I really do. I want to talk about the, uh, the Accountable Care Act and, uh, and the 
parts of it that impact a community health center. We all know uh, in the uh, in the healthcare uh, field that if you don't have electronic medical records, um, you are not going to be existing in the future. We know that the way that uh, community health centers are reimbursed right now, we're reimbursed with free for service. Uh, it's now going to be managed care. So I'm going to tell you, managed care has always been a challenge for us as a community health center because they limit service to to patients, and we need approval of what we can do and what we can do. But that is how the the care is now going to be set up. The um, uh, exchanges are are the managed cares. Of, of, of the future. Uh, people are going to be saying, okay, you have a choice. Go see which uh, plan you want to be uh, part of. Well, let me tell you, if I got hit by a car like this second, I couldn't tell you what to do and what I was entitled to because I would have to go to our staff person and say, okay, here's all my papers. Well, what, what does it cover and what doesn't? Imagine the, that we need to uh, really inform people, the ordinary person in this country, in our communities across the country, what it does this mean, this exchange, what does this mean that I have to purchase um, um, insurance. Um, there's a subsidy that uh, some people might be entitled to. But the fact of the matter is um, the whole Affordable Care Act uh, and yes, there's good things in it, absolutely, I'm not going to say no, but at the same time, there is so much detail that uh, we have to inform ourselves first and then the community. Thanks, Carmen. Um, so I think we'll go ahead. Um, this was really great. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up now. Um, our colleague um, Manuela McDonough um, was having a little bit of, of mic issues at the beginning of the call. So I think we'd like to um, hear any closing remarks, Carmen, that you that you have to say. And then we'll also turn, turn things over to Manuela for a couple of words um, before we end our webinar. This webinar, and I have to be honest with the audience, this is my first webinar. Uh, I, uh, I am very thankful that I was given the opportunity by Pierce for Project for Diane and Manuela and National Council of uh, But, you know, these are partnerships, Chad for Med, uh, our funder. Um, and I, I really uh, want to say to the audience, it can happen. You can do what you want to do. Um, also, you cannot do it alone. I mean, you know, the manner in which uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Ms. Ed Fisher uh, introduced me, you know, all those things happen along the way. You can't concentrate on that kind of stuff. You got to concentrate on, okay, how do I, how do I um, get dental services uh, in Alivio? Um, should we have X-ray? How am I going to do that? Um, who, are going to, who are going to be my relationships as we go forward? Who are going to be the partners, the hospital partners of Alivio? Um, how is it that I can do a better service just in cut waiting time uh, for patients? We're, we are not extra special. What we're saying is we are, are, are people from the community and um, I say to you, honestly, this can be done, but you need yourself to say, I can do it, and get yourself a little core group of people, and you'll be surprised what you will be able to do. Thanks so much, Carmen. This was a great webinar. I'm going to also invite Manuela McDonough from NCLR to also say a few words. Great. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Carmen, so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today about your experiences. Um, I think you're an inspiration, and I, I would definitely argue that you are an extraordinary person who has definitely accomplished extraordinary things. And it's leaders like Carmen and their organizations and the work that they do for Latinos that really makes the work we do here at NCLR possible. Um, 
So I really urge you to get involved. Um, as Carmen mentioned, it's about collaborations and partnerships and relationships and bringing those people together to bring about change. Um, at, the, at the individual level, you can call your representative um, and ask for those requests. Um, you can also visit our website at nclr.org to sign up for action alerts via email or text message that will give you the opportunity to get involved and to advocate to improve the opportunities for Latinos. Um, once again, thank you so much to Carmen um, and her team at Alivio Medical Center for the work that they do on a daily basis to provide health care for, for the Latino community. Diana, this is Ed Fisher. If it's OK, I'd like to ask Carmen one f final question. Yes, sir. Um, you know, Carmen, I, I think you're very gracious in saying that you can't do it alone. It, it takes a team. It also occurs to me that one person is just one person. But two people are a team. Three yes. people are a strong team. You, you don't need a whole crowd. It's sometimes amazing how just two or three people really working together can get a lot done. I'd like your comment on that. Well, you're absolutely right, because how we started our living was a group of three to five people. I mean, it, it just, um, you know, it, it just grew uh, with an intensity to the commitment and the need, and there was nothing we couldn't do. I mean, really and truly, it, it, it started with a very, very small group of people. So I think that's an important lesson for people looking to make things happen in their community. You need, you need an allies, allies, but you don't need a crowd. No, no, absolutely not. And well, I just also, want to add. Let me, let, me, let me say one more thing. There have been many times that I said, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> uh, but I believe in divine providence. I really do. Uh, and we were all put here to do something. And I don't know how, how I got to be the director of Alivio Medical Center, but I was sent here, and I truly believe that. I had no intentions of being involved in uh, as a, as a uh, health uh, in health administration. <laughs> yes, we, we need to take advantage of the uh, opportunities that life throws at us. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to just underscore Manuela's uh, very wise words about the impact that you and Olivio have had and uh, want to thank you again for, for uh, really gracing us with, with your uh, comments this afternoon. Diana, perhaps you want to close things? Yes. Yes, thanks again. And thank you, Carmen and Dr. Fisher and Manuela. Um, so yes, this concludes our webinar. And I just want to mention that we will have the webinar recording along with the video that we weren't able to watch earlier, um, in addition to some other information about Alivio, will be on our website within about a week at peersforprogress.org. So please, um, please visit.